immigration controls are a relatively recent policy which became common only in the 20th century. Although immigration laws may seem like common sense, an unavoidable reality. In most countries, they're in fact less than a hundred years old. International migration, on the other hand, has always existed. Twice as many people migrated from Europe to the rest of the world as have come in the opposite direction. And since the current theory is that human beings originated in East Africa, every other part of the world is the product of immigration. All of us are either immigrants or descendants from immigrants. Freedom of movement should be the new common sense. It is hard to see why people should not be allowed to move around the world in search of work or safety or both. Within European Union, there are growing attempts to secure the principle of freedom for its citizens to live and work in any member country. In the US, there are no restrictions on the movement of people between states. It will be considered an outrage if the inhabitants of a country were not free to travel to another part of the country to get a job there, or if they were not allowed to leave it. Indeed, it was considered an outrage when this happened in the former USSR. The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights asserts these rights. Yet, the declaration is strangely silent on the question of the right to enter another country. Governments claim what seems to be one of their last remaining rights, the right to keep people out of their territories. Few people question the morality, legality, or practicality of this right. Nation-states are the agents and enforcers of immigration controls and country boundaries. Most were themselves not fully established until the 19th century. Now, nation-states are supposed to be on the decline. International institutions such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and World Bank and the World Trade Organization attempt to control the actions of national governments. Economic power is concentrated in fewer and bigger corporations. These put pressure on governments to allow goods and capital to move freely around the world. Unaffected by considerations of national sovereignty. Sometimes they also press governments to allow the free movement of people in order to secure the labor they need for expansion. Yet, by the 1970s, many countries, especially in Europe, but not in North America, had more or less ended the right of people to enter and work. Even if it were morally acceptable for the rich nations of the world to use immigration controls to preserve their disproportionate wealth, it is doubtful whether they achieve this purpose. There is a mass of evidence to show that immigrants actually make a big contribution to the wealth and prosperity of the countries they go to. Economists have also suggested that the abolition of immigration controls would cause a doubling of world incomes. Immigration is not just good for business. It also improves both the job prospects and the wages and conditions of workers. Without immigration, some sectors of industry would collapse or move abroad, which will result in the loss of many other jobs connected to those industries. The U.S. economy, especially its agriculture, building trades and services, is heavily dependent on immigrants including those who have no legal permission to work. Many industrialized countries, especially in Europe, have declining and aging populations. Unless immigration is increased, there will not be enough young workers to pay taxes, keep the public sector and industry functioning, and look after old people. 
It has also been shown that on average immigrants contribute more in taxes than they receive in public services. Those who defend immigration controls often refer to the need to preserve national identity. National identity is hard to define, however. More or less, every country in the world is a product of successive waves of immigration. While immigrants sometimes acquire the negative image of being unable to assimilate, prone to disease and crime, and so on. Most of the migrants and refugees who make it to the rich countries are in fact exceptional people who have to have some money and a great deal of courage and enterprise. They come because they are jobs or because they are in desperate danger. A precedent for the opening of borders exists in the European Union. Those who worked for the abolition of European internal frontiers were inspired not only by the interests of big business and free trade, but by an idealistic view of the future of Europe. Contrary to predictions, the introduction of free internal movement within Europe did not lead to mass migration from poor areas to rich areas. On the contrary, the authorities would like to have more rather than less labor mobility in the European Union. The ability of governments to enforce immigration controls is becoming increasingly unsustainable. The costs and suffering caused by these controls are increasing. Clearly, it would not make much sense to campaign for immigration controls to be ended only in one country. Their abolition would need to be by agreement among the governments of the world. Abolition of borders implies complete freedom of movement for all, and the right to settle and work in a place of the person's choice, just as people can now do within countries. In a more just world order, movements of capital will be democratically controlled to meet people's needs and to reduce inequalities. But people are not goods or capital, and they should be free to move. The attempt to limit this basic freedom leads to some of the world's abuses of human rights, which exist in the world today. The abolition of immigration controls will mean a vast increase in freedom and prosperity for all of us.